my name is George. Then I attended the African School of Physics in 2016 in uh, Kigali, Rwanda. And uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about my work in Eurovascular, Finland, on neutron proton pairing around the N to Z line in mode number 84. Just uh, skip this, it's just an overall of what the presentation is about. Then a little bit of background. I'm originally from Zambia. Uh, can you see my pointer? Yes, I can. At okay. Least. okay, all right. So from down here, central Southern Africa, Land Rock country. I did my first degree there, my high school there. Then after that, I went to South Africa for my master's. At University of Johannesburg, then now I'm up here in Finland doing my PhD at University of Vascular. Just a little bit of background again where I come from on the first picture here on the top left. This is me. I think this is the third week of uh, first year university in the physics lab. Then this is me in the fourth year nuclear physics lab. And there's like a mean crate, a mean crate there with the old computer. I don't remember what operating system this used to use. Yeah. And this is me with uh, my supervisor for my master's, Susan Vombi, graduating from my, after I finished my master's at UJ. And uh, this is me with John Sharpie, one of uh, the big guys in nuclear physics. This was the first time I attended it, an international conference. I think this was in Italy during my master's. Okay, so just a brief introduction of nuclear uh, nuclear physics area of what I'm studying. I included this slide because I know there are some individuals in the, on the seminar who are not in nuclear physics and I wanted to just to give them a brief introduction of what, what I'm doing. So in terms of uh, the nuclear force, we can roughly assume that it's symmetric in uh, symmetrically strong when we apply it to proton proton or neutron neutron or proton neutron uh, interactions. And in this assumption, we end up having uh, two symmetries. One is called charge symmetry and charge independence. And this charge independence is well, a uh, proton proton interaction and neutron neutron interaction are the same. Or we can have charge independence where an average of the proton proton and uh, neutron neutron is equal to the proton neutron interaction. And this symmetry introduces what we call isospin symmetry in nuclear physics. And isospin symmetry is kind of an important fact, uh, uh, part of nuclear physics. And this isospin symmetry is easily started somewhere around the n equal to z line because there. The single part, uh, the, the the proton and the, the neutron occupy the single, the same single particle orbitals. So, using nuclear structure of nuclear structure studies, gamma spectrometry, gamma spec specific, okay, we can able to probe the uh, the single particle orbitals. Yeah, and just some formalization of uh, isospin symmetry. Since we can treat the proton and neutron as the same under uh, this uh, assumption, what we can do is we can generalize that, uh, sorry, not generalize, we can actually assign them what we call a isospin quantum number T and the projection of the isospin, isospin quantum number is uh, one, sorry, one over two or plus or minus neutrons for neutrons and protons. And this definition, usually people have interchanged them in some books or not because it's not a big deal in that case. And for a multi neutron system, you can define this as a, as a projection as n minus z over two. And the total iso spin will range from n minus z over two to a over two and where a is the 
atomic mass number and n and z are the neutron and proton number respectively. And the projection should be not should be not be more than the the total of spin. Uh, people who do a bit of nuclear, I think this is quantum physics. So they always have these angular momentums where they have all those angular momentum rules, and the same apply here to isospin symmetry. Yeah. Okay. So following from this, we can see that for any given t, we have certain values of uh, the projection t, tz. For me, I've chosen tz. I've seen other people use uh, tm. So this is just like uh, one of the things which shows which states are allowed when you talk about isospin symmetry. And the first one at the bottom, sorry, the bottom one there, this is when t equal to zero. Therefore, we can only have one projection, which is t zero. Then if we go to t equal to one, we can have t equal to negative one, t equal to zero, then t equal to one, which is this state here. And in this case, if you have a triplet, a subvert uh, triplet state, let's say for a given uh, set of nuclei where they have the same isospin T, but they have different isospin projections, you expect to have this degenerating energy for let's say T negative one should almost have the same states in T equal to zero and T equal to one. And we see this, let's say, in mass 66. If we assume isospin symmetry holds, then we're expected to have states in these, uh, in these three nucleus, which have the same energy, let's say the two plus state. It will have the same energy in this one, this one, and the third one. But in reality, what happens is we have these isospin breaking uh, uh, breaking parameters, which create this. And one of them is the Coulomb uh, Coulomb repulsion. And the difference in masses between the proton and the and the, the neutrons we end up having symmetry broken. And I have this cartoon to just show you very nice symmetry. Then, ooh, something happens. No more symmetry. Yeah. And we can probe these these differences in these states using uh, a few equations which are simple to yeah simple to do stuff like uh, the mirror energy difference where we probe the, the difference in the energy difference in the in the states for n equal to in this case this is n equal to z plus two and n equal to z minus two and we can probe the energy difference using the mirror energy difference or the triple energy difference where we probe the energy difference of the n equal to z nuclei and the n equal to uh, n equal to z plus two and n equal to minus two then we can able to um, to, to get a bit of uh, knowledge on how these states differ and you can get the thematics of a certain region yeah but for this talk we're not talking about the differences in energy of the, the states in these states. We're talking about the, the pairing of the proton and neutron. So in, we'll concentrate on n equal to z nuclei in the mass 88. This is just an example. Yeah. You can stop me if you have a question at some point. So uh, yeah. the attendants, feel free to, to ask questions. We'll try to ask them. Please okay. go on. So just uh, a brief introduction on the TN pairing. Yeah. So for most heavy nuclei, where the angular momentum is coupled to J equal to zero, and the isospin also, also is usually T. But if you look previously at my previous slide, there's this uh, t equal to, sorry, the t projection equal to zero in in the t equal to one uh, as a spin state. And there's literally no reason to say why the t equal to zero state should not appear also in nuclear physics in, in, in these heavy isotopes. So the question becomes, 
why don't we see this t equal to zero as was been sparing so if i could just sorry go back so i'm talking about this stage here why it does but why does it not appear when we probe this uh, heavy nuclei at equal to zero state go back sorry So, however, there are these experimental and theoretical fingerprints we can look into to check if truly this uh, the t equal to zero p and pairing is there in these heavy nuclei. And for this talk, I'll not concentrate. I'll not talk about these other things. I'll talk about the rotational uh, response of the t and pairing in heavy nuclei. Okay. So I have this example from a paper from uh, a nature paper where they, they, they try to do, they, they do an experiment in polonium 892, yeah, which is n equal to z 46 and uh, 46 uh, neutro neutrons and protons. And I hope you can see this. The first part here, this is from an experiment where they get these excited states. Then the second part, they do this show model uh, calculation and they do not, uh, they don't just normal show model calculation. Then the next one, they have the show model calculation. Then they include this PN, PN uh, interaction in the calculation. Then the third one, they do the show model calculation. Then they include the P, uh, the N, sorry, they include the t equal to one uh, interaction in their calculation. The paper is actually, just actually gives a very good uh, description of what they, they are doing. Although the, the, the nature paper usually they are short and the descriptions are not that good, but I've got good references if you want to read more about it. Yeah. So if you look closely, you see that when they include this t equal to zero interaction in their calculations, the state is very close to what is observed experimentally here. But when they have the t equal to one, the state kind of goes, the two plus state kind of goes up above the two plus state, the observed two plus state, the four plus state also goes a bit high and the rest, they're not comparable to the experimental value. So the question comes, does this show evidence of uh, the t equal to zero p n interaction being dominant in this nuclei. So this way provided the kind of evidence. However, there's still a long way to go for us to, to certainly see the influence of this uh, t equal to zero p n interaction in these heavy nuclei. Yeah. And just one more example of this rotational uh, rotational influence of the PN, PA, sorry, the PN uh, interaction. In this case, the the slide, the image on your left is from Molybdenum 84. Then the top one on the right, is this, this nuclear has the same number of protons and uh, neutrons, and the one below. The, the neutrons are two more than the protons. And when you do these rotational uh, frequency plots, you see that the ones above kind of have almost a straight line. Then the one below, there's this, these curves called backbending. And this is due to the rotational alignment of the, the, uh, the protons, sorry, the protons or the neutrons. So in this case, it's the nucleons and the nucleus. At a certain frequency, this happens that in certain nuclei there's back bending due to the curious force. And in our n equal to z, it's just a straight line. One would assume this is due to the p n interaction or the p n coupling being strong enough that wasn't yet probed uh, state, excited state where this coupling has been broken and there's an alignment. So, however, for molybdenum 84, which is what I'm talking about today, the current uh, highest observed spin is angular mo has angular uh, rotational frequency of 0 0.6, which is somewhere here, 
which is about uh, the 12 class state. And you can see in Molinum almost all the excited states have these brackets, which are tentative because they haven't yet fully been confirmed. And if I go to the next slide, show you a bit more work on shell. Uh, this is projected shell model calculations and concentrate on them again here. Or well, we have the dashed lines are showing. So let me go back to this way. So here we have this uh, Hamiltonian and there's a proton and the neutron interaction and the last part has the proton and neutron interaction. And this part here has this, the proton and neutron interaction actually, this is a mistake here. This is an adjustable parameter depending on the strength of this interaction. Yeah. So in this case of Vegna 84, the dashed line shows the calculated value with enhanced proton and uh, neutron interaction. When, I'm, when I say enhanced, it's just an adjustment of this parameter here. And uh, this reference here gives more details people who are interested in nuclear theory calculations on how these calculations are made. And you can see again, this observed uh, experimental values of excited states in this nuclear don't reach where the theory says there's this, this backbending. And it's, it's pretty hard to say exactly if this is true because we haven't yet observed it in experiments. So this, uh, this paper is actually a challenge to experimental uh, nuclear physics to see if we can see the, the states above the 10 plus state, which is the last one here, and see if this that bending truly exists or if there's just a straight line as from the previous slides where this uh, PN uh, coupling is very strong that we cannot break them and then align them. Okay, so we took break from the theory stuff, and now we go to what is them, why is it on the periodic table? So the black stuff here is our line of stability, and the neutron rich side, we're not talking about that today, and the proton rich side. So this is what molybdenum is, and it's very close to the proton rich line. So, which means these experiments are hard to do, because most of the available beams and targets cannot produce molybdenum in a very green reaction. We we'll have to have like a 2N reaction or something like that to produce it. And if uh, 2N reaction compared to a PN, PN or XPN reaction, a 2N reaction has a low cross section. So that's why they're very hard and it's close the proton drip line, you can see. Yeah, there's nothing much after that, no on this side. Yeah. Okay, so uh, coming to you, you vascular. So this is our setup here. This side, it's the accelerator where we get our beams. Then there's a small accelerator there also. And this side is uh, the Igiso group. They do some mass measurements using a penning trap, and they do some other experiments with uh, laser physics down down there. Yeah. And for my work, I work mainly now from this side, which is our cave with Mara and uh, Eurogam. And this side is Ritu. Ritu is a gas field uh, separator, and Mara is a vacuum mode separator. So for this talk, this experiment was done using MARA, which is a uh, vacuum mode separator. And this is a walk path here, and then the focal plane there. Yeah. And so I think while the, the measurement room is where the computers and everything are supposed to be, and some, there are some other facilities around. Yeah. Okay, so for this. Uh, experiment we actually calculated this using paste and the cross section. This just shows you the maximum cross section of molybdenum 85 somewhere there. 
but we have to consider the thickness of the target. So the beam energy should be a bit higher than that. Then it's produced in this 2N reaction while we produce this compound, excited compound into nucleus, then we lose two neutrons to have our, our nuclear of interest. Yeah. I like this plot because it's kind of an illusion to me because when I look at it, I always get excited. Then I realize that, oh, the cross-section footballism is multiplied by 100. So the actual cross-section, if you remove the 100, just this is about 250, oh sorry, 150 divided by 100, somewhere there. Yeah. And this experiment was done in uh, twice. The first time was in summer 2019, then November 2019. And we had to try several energies because it was a, it's a very hard experiment to do. And at the, the first time around, we learned a lot of information. So at the next time when we did it in November, we actually knew exactly which energy to start from and what setting we had to use for everything, which was nice that allowed us to do this. Yeah. And just one more thing. Usually pace calculations are over, uh, over pace overestimate the cross section. So in this case, if this is small, like small, then up to somewhere here, some reference, some some uh, papers have said that we have to divide this by a certain number depending on your reaction type. So for this, it's definitely lower than this. Yeah. And if you have sorry, if if you have such a low cross section and these other nuclei are produced in this high cross section, the amount of data you have to be mostly concentrated with these other PN channels, PXN channels, and you have so much contaminants. I have to emphasize on that because of what's coming in front. Yeah, okay, so this is now MARA, connected to Eurogam, and at the far end, there is the focal plane. So this is a germanium array detector, and it has, uh, 24 uh, quantum suppressed germanium detectors. These are segmented detectors, and it has 15 which are not segmented, which are in front there. Then the target position sits on the center. This whole thing opens up, and it can move between Mara and the uh, Ritu. Ritu, which is the other side, the gas field separator. Then we have a few magnets here. Then you have an electric field applied in this chamber. Then you have a dipole magnet there, and at the far end is the focal plane. And if you rotate this image the other side, you have the beam dump because when the beam comes and hits target, we produce target-like particles which continue to, to to come through our separator and we dump them there. Then our uh, our recalls, in this case we call them recalls, they'll go through to the the erotic uh, dipole. The, the dipole there up to the focal plane, passing through the electric field in there. Yeah. So the first part separates our recoil due to energy. The second part separates due to M over Q. And the focal plane, we can measure them there. Yeah. So this is a total redox system. By that, what I mean is when an experiment is taking place, we record all the data. Then what you see on the computer depends on what Con, uh, software triggers you have, you have used. Yeah. Although we say we record all the data, I always kind of a, a running joke with myself. In principle, we don't record all the data because we have these, uh, these mass uh, slits. When I say mass slits, we, we put in actual slits in the, in the beam line to block the, some charge space that we receive uh, if you charge this with the focal pen. And one of the most important uh, instruments in this setup is this, the charged particle veto detector, YouTube, we call it here. And it sits just in the center of Eurogam, and this is the actual target there. So in this experiment, the target was placed there on the middle. Yeah. And this charged particle uh, gives us an ability to select uh, certain reaction channels depending on their PXN uh, channels. So if 
I'll go further into discussion when we see the results on how we use the, the, the charge particle vector detector, but it's an important instrument in this, this experiment. And the, the focal plane also has very nice important instruments, such as uh, this MWCP, which is actually the gas counter there. And at, after the gas counter, we have a DSSD, and you can either put it uh, plunge through detect at the end or something else or so let's say plastic insulator if you want to measure beta decays yeah and some clovers detector there to measure isospin iso uh, sorry isomers which don't decay at the target but they have like a long live life up to the end yeah so in this case the gas counter which is mwcp and the dssd also play an important part in this experiment Okay, so just the efficiency and the efficiency of Eurogam, but in this case, I'll just point out to you that the veto efficiency of the charge particle detector is not 100%, and that is also quite important in the coming slide. So this is raw Eurogam data. You can notice that our mass 84, which is, if, if I have to say mass 84 is our mass of interest, is low compared to these other channels, which is uh, this 80 and 8 and uh, 80, sorry, 80 and 83. Before this, this spectrum is before we do any getting on our records or any other getting we can use on our on our instrument. Yeah, this was uh, collected for five days, and the ratio of the first transition. This, tra this transition to these two transition in this case, that's 19%. Yeah. And our first transition of interest in molybdenum lies somewhere there at 444. We, can, we can't see it in this case because it's covered by other reaction channels. Yeah. And the first slide on top is when we get using just uh, the RICO get. By this, I mean the time of flight. So I have to go back a little bit. Maybe I should explain this to some people who are not in nuclear physics. So, so we can measure the time of flight between the gas count and the DSSD and the energy loss. Then we can end up having this this spectra here. And what you see above this big line is our required product. And our records of interest are down there. So these are beam like products. Then our records of interest are down there. Then we're able to create a gate here. And this gate will be applied to the previous slide, which was uh, over Eurogam. Then we have this. So now this first part is recall gated. Then at the focal plane of Mara, we're able to see M over Q. Then we can apply M over Q to select our mass of interest. Then we have this get. So you can see, like uh, here, this get is uh, was made to have mass eighty mass eighty four as mass of interest, and you can see the reduction in this two get. Then something else we added to this analysis is using the gas counter to actually create mass gets also. So this shows just everything at the gas counter. So what you can do is you can actually get with a gamma energy from this spectra, let's say for, uh, from uh, mass 84, then you'll see the mass distribution in your map at your gas counter. Then you can able to, to draw 2D images here to get on the, on the gamma ray energies in Eurogam. Then you produce this, which is also fairly uh, dominated by mass 84. Then the last spectra D is a combination of uh, this one M over Q and the gas counter get. Yeah. At the bottom, there are some numbers there. We can see from 19% without uh, creating any gets in our data, we have 47% uh, when we, we use this recall get. Then when we add M over Q get to this, we have 60%, uh, and if we use the gas counter get on the record on the record gated uh, data, we have 64, and if we combine the two, we go to 60% again, which is kind of 
That makes sense because we kind of have to loosen our get to to accommodate the data loss for this. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, George. There was one question in the chat that I that I didn't see. Do you want okay. to take it now? Yes. So uh, can we talk about pairing in the case where the two nucleons are aligned rather than anti-aligned? Pairing in the case where the two neutrons are aligned. Okay, so that is something to... Uh, okay, is it here? So, um, Jasper, uh, can you turn on your yeah, microphone and give some precision about your question? Jasper, can you can you speak? I think uh, I can give a brief, uh, just a brief uh, answer to, to that because if we have two two new two neutrons aligned. It's it's actually this case where we have Z. So in this case, we have two extra neutrons in the orbital, which are which can be aligned, and we have this rotational uh, where we have these bands, have this back bending, and this is also observed in other nuclei, other heavier nuclei, so it's most prominent. If I remember, where well, I can give an example, just out of this field where we have uh, in mass uh, one, five, two, one, five, four, where we have uh, two neutrons in the F7 half, and when they align, the back bending appears, and that is very nice plot where you can see that, yeah. No, sorry, is it one? In Europium, some heavy isotope in, in, Europe, in Europium, where they did the first experiment, where they did the first, uh, slide of this back bending. That actually gives a better picture of this. Yeah. There there are two neutrons which are aligned, which are aligned and the back bending happens. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, if they are aligned, actually the J will not be equal to zero. That's why I'm wondering if we can still talk about pairing in different case, like let's say J equal to one, because the spin will be half and half, right? For two proton and two neutron that you we are maybe taking from different orbitals. Okay, so in that case, sorry, oh, sorry, I went the other direction. Or maybe because it's the most like magical configuration that- uh, I didn't like get you, can you repeat yourself? Neutron or two proton to be, yeah, I'm saying in the case where the two nucleons are aligned, like let's say mm -hmm. they are in different orbitals, the J will not be equal to zero because we'll have different, uh, we'll have the same value of spin. The spin will be like intrinsect spin will be half and half. So in that case, can't we talk about pairing or it will still be pairing? Mm. It, in the case, what what you're talking about, I don't, I, I don't know if you're talking about the ground state or an excited state, because you can see an example I gave here is rotational alignment in excited state. Yeah. Yeah. So where we have two new, this is, uh, let's say, da, 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 da. for this example here, Where we have these uh, these excited states, we have the neutrons. In this case, we have two neutrons in the last uh, last orbital. Uh, two neutrons above the z equal to n line, and we can assume that nothing else happens. Then, when we do these rotational curves, this is produced due to the alignment of the neutrons. Not that the ground state uh, p changes no it's the fact that we're excited we're looking at it in terms of the excitement function not just that i don't know if my explanation is good enough i don't think so. Yeah. so is that only the case when you talk about the ground state or it can happen with 
any different like state to get that uh, pairing you assume no, should be equal to zero the total angular momentum no because if if you have let's an example of this one again at the end more than where we have 42 42 so the ground state is equal to zero because everything is even right yes so if, yes. if you if if we make this odd if we add one here we won't have the ground state zero right yes yeah so that, that's that's what i was trying to say yeah oh. so no i'm talking about pairing like okay. the two nucleon that you you say z equal to in z equal to n line if the two proton or the two neutron are paired with different say let's say different uh, orbitals can you still have the j equal to zero or you can also have different configuration of j that's that is exactly my question uh, i think you can have different configuration of j depending on what you what you use yeah okay. in this case okay. these, these last two the last uh, when i said the neutron number is z plus two i mean only two neutrons everything else can be paired together and the last two neutrons will be paired together right so and when okay. we increase this rotational frequency these last two neutrons can be aligned easily than when we have this this one above i think I'm going to explain this is what the interpretation of this graph is. So the one above, we have one proton and one neutron and paired to the others. These are the ones which pair up. And when we do the rotational function or the rotation, we can plot the rotational frequency and spin. We can see that this pairing is kind of strong and it's not easy to break. And below when we have two neutrons okay. and we have the rotational frequency on the on the x and spin on the other side at high spin you can see that these two kind of break and they can align and in the breaking we have this cave which is called the back bending yeah okay all right thank you all right. sorry I'll go back okay so this was the last done uh, experiment from what number 84 and I have to show you I hope we can all agree that these peaks are kind of small almost just above background so the first one what they did is they just have uh, gamma gamma uh, they have a uh, veto on charged particle and uh, these guys in the experiments included what they what they call a neutron they have a neutron detector so they're able to to say if a reaction is in coincidence with some, some neutrons and for us you don't have that part and the bottom one this one c sorry is uh, a cube where they have gamma 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 and they have a coincidence with a neutron and uh, ruvito charged particle then they have about almost 10 counts on the second transition which is 664 then this other one is here then they claim this other one is there then the last one somewhere in the background which is the 10 plus so our goal is to see if we can see all these transitions and anything above that yeah so next this is our result so the first slide above is gamma gated on the first uh, 444 four, uh, carry electron vote transition, zero gum, and no other mass get on it, just the recall gated zero gum. So, using the first gate from those four slides I, show you, I showed you previously. Then the second one, B, sorry, it's supposed to be a D. This one is when now the tube comes into play, that uh, charged veto detector. So in the tube, you can actually set conditions, say, okay, when the tube detects a charged particle, call that tube pod one, 
when in stage two, charge particle two, two for two, three, and so on. And the one on the middle here, here is when we say the tube detects no charged particle, and you can see how the statistics reduce. However, our spectra is still dominated by these transitions from the mass 80, 83, and 84. Yeah. So this is kind of a sign that, okay, we produce molybdenum when we have zero tube, uh, zero charged particle in the tube detector, we have this peak there and a little peak there. And we have one charged particle in the tube, in the tube. we have almost nothing just background there. Yeah. So what we did after that is we introduced the mass gate now. In this case, we used the M over Q and the gas counter gated and we did some background subtraction using zero gram time gates. And what we have on the middle is when we have zero charged particle in the zero gram, in that case it's charged particle vetoed, and we have one charged particle in the in the in the tube, charge one charged particle in coincidence in that case. And we can see a bump at uh, six seven three and eight 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 nine here. Yeah. So these are our next two transitions, that's uh, four to two, then six to six to four. Yeah. But clearly we're still contaminated with uh, transitions from these BXN channels in our spectra, and it's hard to prove to actually convince someone that there's these transitions there. Yeah. So next, what we these are this is just uh, from the previous slide showing uh, mass gated uh, euro, uh, mass gated using M at the gas counter and M over Q and charge particle zero and the same one, the same spectra, just background subtracted and kind of goes crazy of these spikes here, but our peaks of interest here exist. Then the third one, what we did is we created a gamma gamma matrix and set a tube foot condition on this gamma gamma matrix to be greater than zero, but less than four. So in that matrix, we superimposed uh, reaction channels, which are P, uh, let's say 1P, 1P, 2P, 2, 2XP, and all, almost all reaction channels appear in this greater than zero, less than four uh, spectrum. Then we normalize that spectra to the two for zero spectrum, then we subtracted the two. Then when we create a gate on four for four transition, we can see our peaks of interest kind of appear above this, a bit more above background. And there's this uh, 1063, which, was, which is also there. Although not, conf not I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell this to anyone, but, I wouldn't tell this to anyone because I think people would want to debate if it's truly there, but I believe it's there. Yeah. And the other transition is kind of nicely out there. Yeah. So after that, we decided, okay, we can go a bit little bit further and try to do some other subtractions to this. So that's the previous slide above, the last one, last good spectra above. So what we do now is we went to our get a transition, which is on 444, and we created a get on either side of our peak of interest. Then we normalized the resultant uh, spectra. Then we subtracted it to this spectra. Then now what we're supposed to have is a clean spectra where we do not have uh, transitions from other channels, although it's too little bit exists because our veto detector is not a hundred percent as I previously said. Yeah. So this is kind of very new work like from last week. And I'm more happy now about this transition. A little bit more about this also. And compared I, I don't know how one would feel about uh, the twelve twelve uh, twelve zero seven. Sorry, let me go back. And I should just go back and, yeah. So this is the 1207 from these guys. 
and uh, 1063 again. Then now we have the 1063 there, then the 1207 there. It's kind of how much time have you spent looking at this for you, for you to be convinced right now, but there's still a lot of work happening in this, in this region of the spectrum, but at least we're able to reproduce these two transitions and confirm them. Yeah. And now I'll just show you a comparison between our data and what is published in rapid communication. So what we have above here, A, is what we start with when we create the first uh, spec uh, matrix, then we create a gate on it. We hardly see anything because we are, we are so, we are so much dominated by these PXN channels that there's not much you can tell. But after all the background subtraction stuff turned out that uh, this energy 673, and 889, and here 1063, and the last one, which is kind of the, the last two, which are kind of debatable because I think they're still in background, but very almost out there. Yeah. And compared to the last uh, published data, I'm happy that we're not dominated by these other transitions like them, but a bit unhappy that we're not able to produce these ones a bit, a bit more clean, I guess. That's your work in progress, as I said. Yeah. Then the last spectra is when they have charged uh, particle in coincidence, and the 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 transitions kind of disappear, which is kind of important to show. So I included this to show that okay, although them uh, they did this work, we also did this work, and we can show that from this we move to that. And I'm sure this work also started from having so many transitions and able to produce this peak there. Yeah. So in conclusion, I would say that can can uh, we haven't yet seen the transitions above the 10 plus state, but work is still in progress, and we can confirm the other transitions below that, apart from the 1007 and the 1063, probably. This week, if the experiment has to take place again, we might need something called an uh, analyzation chamber to give us an added uh, getting condition. And this is an image which shows how an ionization chamber will be able to select these masses. This is from uh, Michigan State University. They have an ionization chamber at the S800 at the end of their, their big uh, spectrometer. Yeah. And since we haven't seen anything above the 10 plus state and we haven't uh, confirmed those, yeah, we haven't seen anything above the 10 plus state yet, I should say. We cannot really say if uh, this pairing, the N, NP pairing, plays such a dominant role in that, um, in the in the heavy nucleus, and if that back bending truly exists as, as uh, presented in theory, yeah. But however, we'll see how, I will go the way, and it would be nice if we can go closer in excitation energy to where the projected back bending should exist, or if it does exist for real. Yeah. Okay, so this is the people in the group. Certain individual, uh, individuals are missing because this picture was taken before the COVID, and everyone was allowed to be together. Yeah, I think most of them. Uh, did a lot of work from different parts of the instruments because it's just such a large group. Yeah, and there are some old guys here who are always there for advice, and that's my supervisor. And that is me with my lost hair from my first year picture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, George, for this very nice talk. Um, are there more questions or maybe comments? George, my name is Rauno Yulin. I, Hello. My question is, you were playing with the gate on two plus zero plus transition. Yes. Is, does it 
make sense to, or is it hopeless if you add the four plus two plus gate? Or is it, um, I mean, to get more statistics for the higher energy transitions in the level scheme? I mean, then URAS band. Yes, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question, actually. Well, we're actually working on that because previously, these, if you look at this spectra here, mm. the, the next transition lies somewhere here. So, for us to create a double gate from the Two mm. plus to the zero plus and four plus to the two plus, we kind of get uh, we kind of get on this contaminant. So what we're trying to do now is to have a properly clean gamma gamma uh, matrix. Then we'll be able to get on the second transition also. Then probably see a bit further than the the, the twelve zero seven. Yeah, I've, uh, we have made the uh, progress in that. I, I think it might work. Hey, I have another comment. In the high spin studies, typically to go about back bending, uh, experimentally it also means that in the gamma ray spectrum the intensities drop down typically because it's sort of branching. So that, that will be the problem also if you put your excellence. You, you need to have much higher statistics and higher efficiencies and so on. But hopefully the ionization chamber and so on will help. Thank you. Anyway, any, anyway hard work. Uh, it's, uh, you really need to work hard to get such a high quality spectra at the end. Thank you, Rana. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, one of the problems we have the intensity going down, and you can tell. Although this is subtracted, background subtracted, we are kind of almost in background. So if we have to get something there, we have to come up with a new method which does not completely subtract our spectra or use the gas chamber and kind of help something more. Yeah. So, but George, what, how, what about getting, how are you going to get a higher statistics data? Uh, in this case, uh, we can uh, let's see. We have to, to adjust our gates a bit, but again, the problem is if we adjust our gates and make them loose, then we allow these other P excellent channels in. That's why probably the, to do the experiment with the ionization chamber would be better. Yeah. Let's see. I can throw my supervisor is around. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Okay, oh, maybe but anything else? So how do you, but is there a problem to get the ionization chamber or is there, do you have plan for, is it gonna be integrated in the experimental apparatus? What's the plan yeah. for that? Uh, I think the last, uh, some time back, there was some discussion on building an ex, uh, the chamber, yeah, for our apparatus. But probably, uh, since the experiment was done twice already, we'll have to apply again to the pact to, to have this done if we get the chamber. Yeah. But someone, I think if I remember well, there's someone building an existing chamber for our group. Yeah. George, could you go to page number 18? Uh, no, not this one. Maybe sixteen. I don't. Know. <laughs> oh yeah, page number eighteen. Yes, stay stay on page number. Could you explain a little bit why the veto efficiency varies with the channel configuration? Okay, so veto would change based on the energy also. Yeah, because we have the. Let's see if I go back. So it's a scintillator uh, detector where we have this synthetic material and some 
uh, some port multiplier at the bottom connected to them. Yeah. So the, the energy will change based on the in the sorry, the efficiency will change based on the energy deposited in the scintillator. Yeah. So if we have two N, let's say for P uh, this this channel, we have two of them, we have a different energy distribution for P U different energy distribution. And if you have an alpha alpha N, then you expect this to reduce because you have two two protons and two neutrons and the energy deposit, uh, deposited in the detector also is different. Yeah. Okay, George, I think this is the previous uh, slide. I think uh, there's another slide where I have a question. Uh, yes. Maybe go back more. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, there's the slide where you have the 201 GV uh, beam uh, and you have you have a plot. Oh yes, yeah, this one. yeah. So I was expecting the peak of um, of uh, the the MO84 to be right uh, at 201, but it's slightly lower. Is, is that? Could you explain that a, a little bit? Yeah, so the first part is, uh, okay, the, the easy answer is always uh, when we do the calculation of uh, the beam energy, we have to consider the target thickness. So in this case, I think, uh, let's say, okay, I'm not, I can't remember off my head exactly the, the target th thickness used. And so the calculation of the reaction pace does is they are on the center of uh, the target. So you have to lose a little bit of energy at the first part of the target and you create this compound on the center. Then you lose, since you're already on the center, then you have to lose a little bit of energy the other side. So this is actually, there's some energy loss because this is 290, maybe it's like 198. And there's like MAV, uh, five MeV loss uh, in the first half of the target. That's why there's this. And trace calculations usually they're a bit off, and they overestimate the cross section. So this beam energy was done after several several times, like changing the beam energy, and this was selected after that. But it's very close to what was calculated after considering the energy loss in the first half of the of the target. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, my my next question is also on this page. Uh, so, um, could you explain a little bit why there is a hundred, a factor of a hundred difference in the cross section between these two, uh, um, you know, eighty four? Because I, I I assume that uh, the MO and the NB both have uh, the same uh, Z and N, right? Yes. Uh, so let me, what, what's the what's the difference in the cross section? What's the spring in that factor of hundred? Okay, let me go to this slide and I try to explain using that. So our compound which is produced is uh is number eighty six, which is here. Then we have to have this two N to go to eighty four, which is there. Then mostly whatever if you go back to this slide, whatever is produced is kind of going through you have uh, the highest, uh, sorry, let me just look at my chart, PN channels. So almost all of them have a proton lost and a neutron lost, or if not two protons and two neutrons. And from there, so two protons, you go there and we lose some more, we even have some, if you look at the data, we even have uh, this one probably alpha something lost. So, because in these reactions, the compound is produced in such an excited state that it's easy for it to lose a proton than a neutron. Yeah. So, uh, what is it called? Is it? Uh, yeah. I guess that's that's the explanation. So we produce a compound which is easily, which can easily lose a proton due to coulombic, uh, sorry, coulombic power energy than two neutrons there. Yeah. That's 
Uh, thanks, George. I don't have any more questions. I think I saw something in the chat, but I can't see the chat. Um, I cannot see new questions in the chat, but if someone else has a question, just uh, speak up. Uh, George? Yes. Do you, do you take uh, some uh, systematic uncertainty in your cross-section calculation or you just take statistical uncertainties? Okay, yes. Uh, in this case, these calculations are done using um, this PACE code and PACE does produce some, uh, some some uncertainty or some errors in the in the cross section produced, but I would say that space gives a rough estimation of where your beam energy should be, yeah, and it's not uh, it's not hundred percent accurate. It overestimates the cross section, so probably someone has to do an actual calculation to get the proper cross section and have those uncertainty in them, yeah. Then just take the calculated values from PACE. Because I included this to show that, okay, PACE was here. Then if you add 100, uh, sorry, 5 MeV, you come back somewhere here to what we have used. But this value was not just determined based on PACE. It was determined based on several hours of changing beam energy and trying to see what intensity we get at the focal plane at Lady Yeah. And what is the uncertainty on your beam energy? Mm. Any uncertainties, or you don't take this into account in your? No, I have to. I'm not. I'm not sure off, my, off, off the top of my head what's the state of the beam energy. Obviously, there is. It's not exact. There's always some variation. Even in, I gave on the other slide. I gave some value of uh, uh, beam current. That is not to say that for five days it was actually like 25. No, probably it went a bit up, it went down, stuff like that happens. Yeah. So okay. the accelerated beam energy is is uh, what we order if we say 200 MeV. So it's within two percent. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So okay. That's my, yeah. it's not much. It's not much. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Is this a dedicated beam? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, is the beam dedicated just to this experiment or do you use it uh, tertiary? Uh, it was for this experiment. Yeah. Thanks. For this, yeah, for this case, it was for this experiment, but our accelerator is able to produce different types of beams to different experimental stations. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe just one uh, naive question, George. You mentioned yep. a neutron detector. I think, uh, uh, can you explain uh, uh, how how it works? Okay, so uh, sorry, let me go back. It was with reference to this other study which was done somewhere else. They have uh, from from their description in their paper, they have a target position and a neutron. That's actually called a neutron wall. Where uh, blah, 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 I don't remember what they did. Yeah. I think it's kind of, uh, I'm not sure exactly what detector it was, but they kind of described it in their paper, which is one of the references. But in this case, they used the neutron as a, a coincidence detector where when the reaction happens, there will be channels produced. And if they detect a neutron and they can kind of go back and veto with their proton, uh, the charge particle detector and they have these clean spectra. And, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I thought it was in your experiments. Experiment. No, no, no. It, it wasn't. No, it's, it's uh, with this uh, other experiment which was done, which was trying to compete to compare with the results. Okay. 
Um, other questions? This is a very nice talk, George. I, I really appreciate it. I learned a great deal from it. Uh, you. Do you have plans for your next uh, measurement? Okay, so that is a very nice question. I'm happy to, to answer it. Thank you. Yeah. So previously, we the, our last experiment, me and the nurse supervisor and the group, was on Krypton 82, which is down there. Then from then on, uh, previously we did mass 80, sorry, mass 62 and mass uh, 66. These are all N equal to Z nuclei we're interested in. Yeah. For, yeah, I think this was the, the heaviest we've done so far from the time I've been here. Yeah. So right now there are other experiments which are scheduled to, to take place in our setup and they do most of them actually they're not in this in this region world. Yeah. So the next that I'll be looking at it will be something in lower mass when we when we completely conclude this mass eighty four. So when do you expect your PhD, George? Uh, Pano, can you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that the other two data sets we have collected now are a bit easier to analyze the, the nuclei. What we have are actually Krypton-70 and Bromine-70 and then Gallium-62 and Germanium-62 and these are fast beta emitters and the fast beta decay we can use as a, as a so-called DAC to see the prompt gamma rays. So those, those are a bit easier to analyze than this data. But I hope you can do it in two or three years. Finish this analysis. Yeah. It, it, I have to say it is terribly, not terribly hard, it's very challenging and learned a lot of new techniques of this background subtraction to get this spectra on what, which doesn't seem very nice if you just look at it, but a lot of man hours have gone into producing it. Yeah, this is yeah. this is particularly hard analysis because the, the channel of interest lies in the in the big vast background and there are nothing or not much you can do to pull it out except the, the charged particle veto and then the associated subtraction methods, what George has been developing now. And I think, I, I hope we can still do a, a one step better here uh, using the double gating, what Raun was also suggesting. Yeah. Maybe I should point out that uh, our laboratory is a university laboratory where the students really need to work hard. So. George, for example, participates in every experiment we have. And we have lots of experiments per year. I don't remember, maybe 2,000 team time hours. And, and the students are really responsible for many things, developing electronics and so on, uh, and preparing detectors and so on. So it's not only only this work he is doing, but many, many other things. And uh, in our opinion, this is part of the education and very, very important. Oh, yes, this is really fantastic. Uh, That's very uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, So George, so I think uh, next time uh, you're going you're gonna to get more interesting results and you can come and talk to us again about how, how it is going. Uh, I hope so. When you, when you develop these techniques uh, to pull out your signal from this background, that would be fantastic. <laughs> to, to, yeah. It would be nice to hear from you again. But uh, uh, good luck to you. This is, uh, I think you are in good hands then. And you have the opportunity to learn uh, many different techniques and, and that's what we want to see. Thank you. So, um, Steve, the people who want uh, 
who want to um, turn on the video so that we can take a screenshot. Oh, okay, yeah, please, uh, everyone, turn turn on your your camera and uh, so that we can share a uh, screenshot. Yeah, man, uh, sorry to arrive late. There was other issues. <laughs> Hi, Aman. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I had my mic off. Hi, everyone. Okay. Was... Really happy to hear the good comments from the professor, so I think it's very important and and sounds yeah. really impressive job that you did. I'll look a bit more in detail. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, let me just see. It's, uh... Hi, Fatty. All right, so 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 that's it. Um, Good um, job, George. You you're you're on your way. That's that's very impressive. So you you're in a right, good place, I think. That's great. Yes, it's uh, it's very nice. Yes. And uh, trying to learn the language now, so I can speak in better. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> tell us. So how do, how how do you uh, say good morning in uh, in Finnish? Uh, okay. <laughs> That's oral examination. <laughs> yeah, you put me on the spot. <laughs> George, George, you should Do you tell that. that George, you should tell that we have had very good winter. Yeah. Seventy, yeah. 70 yeah. centimeters of snow every of snow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's the longest winter I've been here. <laughs> the first yeah. one. In Sweden, we had the same problem. We never saw that much snow. I mean, for 10 years I've been here, so I guess that you've been lucky. Yeah, this year was very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, have snow yet. we never see snow. <laughs> okay, so I'll say Kitos. Voilà. Uh, Hoover Paiva. Okay. Hoover Paiva. <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye bye. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think I will stop the, the recording now and I will uh, um, upload the, the video to the, to the Indico page. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, George, for this very nice talk. And uh, we wish you the best for the continuation of your PhD. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Right. Good to see you all. Thank you. Stay well. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.